to present one of his insightful lectures entitled The Life of Lord Mahavira, Refused to the Demon King, Part 1 of 6, on Between Master and Disciples, given in English on August 25, 2019 in New Land Ashram, Taiwan, also known as Formosa. Hi, how are you guys? I think I drink a little water. If you don't eat anything, you drink water also good, okay? Has a lot of a lot of nutrition inside. Really. In the air also. The water, the sun, everywhere has nutrition. Just our body cannot absorb it, not uh, uh, habitually absorb these things. Yeah. Ah, very good. Something, not just water, lemon. Good for me. Sesi Guang Ling. Anyway, when you became a monk or nun, you have different name. And first of all, you shave your head, yeah. And afterward, you can grow back. You know, it depends on the order. Yeah. The Hindu monk, they let their hair grow also. Uh, because if they wander around, they don't have money to go to the barber shop, and they don't have equipment to shave their hair, so they let their hair grow. Mm. So if you see a monk with long hair, don't think he's not a monk, okay? Oh, a nun, yeah. Some monks and nuns in India, they don't wear any clothes. Really, zero. Don't think any negative thing about them, okay? Still need to take reverence, because these things they do, you cannot. You cannot, yeah? At least they're strong, okay, in their uh, determination to, to find the truth. By doing that, whether or not they find the truth is another question. But still, their strong will, their determination, their thirst for the truth, make them forget everything, forsake everything, that's enough for you to revere them, okay? And to help them with whatever you can, okay? I always make offering to monks and nuns, whatever order, Catholic, Hindu, Tibetan, Buddhist, Jain, Muslim also, okay? If I know, I always make offering, yeah. very respectfully, with love also, and wish them well. Mm. How's Mongolia? Good? Good, yeah, very good, Master. Yeah, wonderful. Every country good, yeah? Yes. yes. USA. USA, France, France, mm. eh. USA, Australia, somewhere? No? Oh, why you sit so far? <laughs> uh, Mexico? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Costa Rica? 
Korea. Today I read you another story. I have a note. I will read it after, or in between. Now, we know Lord Mahavira was the most ascetic um, monk that we have known up to now. Yeah, maybe there are more, but the uh, history did not write it down uh, because uh, maybe they don't have disciples to write it down, or maybe they don't ever recount their story to anyone else. Mostly the ascetic monks or nuns or practitioners, they just go into a jungle or somewhere very far away from any disturbance and interference of humans' energy and minds. They can disturb you, of course. They don't need magic power. If they are very strong, Minded, they can send disturbance to you uh, with or without their knowledge. Some people don't do things on purpose. It just happened that there's strong will and they have some trouble in their mind, and then you will also perceive it. That's why most of the monks and nuns in the old time, they go far away from the city. Yeah, Maybe they live together, or maybe they live alone, but they don't chitty chatty all day long. They live together because they have the same ideal, same uh, uh, direction, yes, or practice. They wanted to know the truth, yes, and they try it their way. And I told you many times, uh, several times before, that if you follow the Buddha's teaching and you became a monk or nun or even lay person at home by yourself and you follow the precepts, then you will also be liberated. Even the Buddha is no longer in the world. But the Buddha is always in the world. His body, physical appearance, only left our eyes, <laughs> our physical eyes, our physical perception. But the Buddhas, the saints, never leave us. Okay? They are always around, helping us. If we are sincere, then they will help us not because they discriminate the sincere one and the not sincere one. It's just because if we are sincere, we will purify ourselves with that determination and sincerity. And then we have no border around us, around our magnetic field. So the Buddha can easily bless us and help us to uplift the Buddhas or the saints. Don't think I'm preaching only Buddhism. The saints. Buddhas mean saints of the highest order in these shadow worlds. They sacrifice everything for us and they help us all the time, just that we don't know it and we cannot perceive it because we are blind, deaf <laughs> and ignorant. But because we don't see them, mostly we are blinded, blindfolded by our karma, ignorance or whatever ambition we have. So we think the Buddha has gone to nirvana he has gone to nirvana, for sure. But he has never left the world at the same time, okay? It's just the terminology saying that the Buddha has gone to nirvana, or this saint and Jesus have gone to heaven, is not true. Because they are saints, they are Buddhas. They always have compassion and mercy for all beings, the suffering in this world and any other worlds in the shadow universe. So they linger, they left some connection. If we pray to them earnestly, sincerely, without any low motive, for noble purpose, they always respond. The sincerity makes us pure, and it's easy for us to receive. Like it's raining, the rain doesn't discriminate uh, the bushes from the rocks, from the earth, or anywhere, a good or bad person, the rain just rains. But if we are inside a cover, then we don't get the effect of the rain. Or the, the sun also, when it shines, it shines on everybody, yeah? It doesn't think, oh, this person is bad, that person is good. Even if a good person stays inside a house, then the sun also cannot reach. That's all, that's all, okay? Similar to Buddhas and saints, they're always around, they're always with us all the time. 
we rejected them. Not knowingly, but by our actions, our thoughts, and our speech, when not pure, not sincere, or harmful, then, uh, then we obstruct ourselves, you know, as if we reject the blessing of the Buddha, the saints. All the saints since time immemorial, whether or not they uh, incarnate on the planet in the human body or invisible, or they live forever. For example, like Babaji in the Himalaya, whether or not they live forever in the physical body or in the invisible uh, manifestation, they always thinking of us and wanting to help us. That's the only thing they do, helping all sentient beings. It's just that sentient beings cannot always perceive it or receive it fully because of obstruction of karma, uh, ignorance, all kind of false conception or thinking. So in any situation, when you're really desperate, just pray. Pray to the living Buddhas or the past Buddhas. They all will help. You are never alone unless you choose to be. <laughs> you choose to be, meaning you don't need any help. You, you don't believe in any Buddhas, any saints, any gods, anything. Then, of course, but the Buddhas are still standing by. The saints are still standing by in case you turn around. They never leave us, okay? Don't worry that you're alone. You're never alone. Worry about yourself, about your karma, your mind, your ignorance, your own stubborn nature. Some of you cannot come to the new land for some reason. Do not blame anyone except yourselves, okay? Not even your families or your friends who obstructed you. Blame yourself only. There are something within you that you have not discovered. You must take any opportunity to go deeper inside you. Because if things sometimes go easy, we think that we are okay, we are good. No, no, truly. Only the discerned eyes can see, can see that we have problem. We ourselves sometimes cannot. Just like the jewelry, like diamond, only the expert eyes can see what is real or fake. It has a flaw or is it perfect? You know that. Nowadays they have magnifying glasses, which are also helpful in some way. But it doesn't beat the uh, expertise of the trained eyes. So, Master, Saints, Buddhas see all this, but they do not mind. They only feel sorry for us. But feeling sorry for us doesn't mean <laughs> it helps us in some way. We are the one who must help ourselves. Similar to some of us, when we practice even Kuan Yin method, and we arrive to some special stage, as I told you in Sura Gama Sutra, many different states that we arrive to. Do not feel proud, because when you feel comfortable, that is when you have trouble. The road is long. Always have to pray for the Master power to help you, okay? And all the Buddha, the saints, to help you. Otherwise, you will fall. Kuaning method is the safest one. The Buddha said there are 84,000 methods of practicing. Why did the Buddha only recommend Kuaning method? The inside sound, you know, the original sound and the original light. Why? Anybody knows? A pen? Pen? Souvenir? No, you pretend you don't know all the time. <laughs> you always try to make me feel good. <laughs> like I'm the only one who knows everything. I pretend I know something. <laughs> I pray to the Buddha to enlighten me, to tell you. Many methods, very arduous, you know, very difficult to practice. And one of the methods is very, very common to you, very well known to everyone, from animals to humans. 
but it's very dangerous to practice. That's the thing. That's one of the method, one of the 84,000 methods that very, very rare being taught and very difficult to practice until perfection. Which one? Anybody happen to know? It's very familiar to you. Daily you know it. Man, woman, eh, teenager, they know already. They don't. Yeah, tell me. <laughs> no, <laughs> that is not difficult. I say it's very difficult, pleasant, but dangerous. Which one is that? I give you so much hint, you don't know. Every day you know about it, except the monks and the nuns, of course. <laughs> and they also know, they just don't, don't practice. <laughs> yeah, I thought you knew. No. Okay. Mm. Well, you practice how many years and you have no wisdom? Mm? You cannot guess? Being awake all day, 24 hours? <laughs> you must be joking. I can't do that. I sleep, tell you. I sleep on the job even. <laughs> when I do in some uh, documents, you know, and I was so tired, I slept. I told you last time, and my snore woke me up. <laughs> I didn't tell you? Yes. Yeah, I'm not ashamed to tell you. <laughs> my body is different from my soul. <laughs> And my soul is different from a master power also. I slept sometimes during checking a document or signing stuff, yeah. At least I don't sign when I sleep, and that is something good. <laughs> okay. I make sure I sign when I'm awake. If I'm sleepy already, then I don't do anything. Either that or I go eat, I go eat something, and then it wakes me up also. Because after eating, Hey, you forget the sleepiness, you feel the taste of the food, and after that you must go brush your teeth quickly. After eating, you must brush your teeth quickly to protect your teeth. Then, oh, by the way, you also wash your face because you, you brush your teeth and the toothbrush foam go all over you, and then you wash your face, then you're awake. Also, okay. So nobody knew? Huh. <sighs> Ah, you make me come every Sunday, and then you don't know anything. How nice. It's a little bit uh, also shy for me, embarrassing for me to say it, but I have to tell you, okay? Maybe you can make use of it in your daily life, in your family life. You know what that is then, now? Sex. Ah, good. Who's that? Who told me? Did you hear that? Yes. Okay, right. The physical intercourse between man and woman, that's one of the methods of practice. But don't try. Only those who have family already then try to limit it. And even if you have to do it, mostly for the purpose of having children, for some reason. But even then, sex is not for recreation. Sex is not for, for physical enjoyment. Sex is not even for love. It is for enlightenment. Truly, it is for enlightenment. God has given us this uh, physical mean, but then many people abuse it. Most of the people abuse it for self-pleasure. It's not for pleasure. It is for enlightenment, truly like that. The physical intercourse between man and woman, that's one of the methods of practice. But don't try. Only those who have family already then try to limit it. And even if you have to do it, mostly for the purpose of having children, for some reason. But even then, sex is not for recreation. Sex is not 
for, for physical enjoyment. Sex is not even for love. It is for enlightenment. Truly, it is for enlightenment. God has given us this uh, physical mean, but then many people abuse it. Most of the people abuse it for self-pleasure. It's not for pleasure. It is for enlightenment, truly like that. In India, there are some uh, schools that teach tantric yoga. If it's a real tantric yoga, they include the studying of the physical contact with the opposite sex. But you must control it. You just perform the physical action, but you do not, you do not continue until the end. You have to stop before it ends. Then all your energy will rise up and you could see the light. You could even hear the inner self at that moment or a little afterwards. It's not immediately, maybe not. Maybe not when you stop the highest peak of the action, yeah? So you do not waste your energy and your physical stamina as well as physical precious energy huh? and spiritual energy as well that comes with that. This method hardly can be taught and hardly can be learned. But if you want to try, you can. If you are married, you can try that. See how you feel afterwards, then you can believe what I'm saying. Okay? You can see the light flooding to you or flash into you, hear the sound, overwhelmingly strong and beautiful. But it doesn't last forever, because it's difficult for you to remain in samadhi after that. You still feel very exciting. You still feel this arousal of some sensation and desire. Just you put it under control only. That method, I hardly found any good master to teach. Some so-called teacher and master make use of that for problem, for abusing the pleasure of it. I have met one. I didn't try anything with him, please don't think nonsense. He was a Tibetan monk from England, but he studied with a Tibetan master. The master was probably good, maybe he was good as well. But his wife staying behind in England and teaching this method after learning. And then he told me that she's not really teaching it. She's just making use of that for her own desirous pleasure. And that, he told me, influenced him, affect him even all the way to India. I forgot all this long time already, but now I talk about this, I remember this incident. He, I met him in Dharamsala, yeah, where the Dalai Lama resides, yeah, and many monks, nuns, schools to teach monks and nuns and lay people about Buddhism. Yes, it's a beautiful place. And all the hills are covered with rhododendron when it's time. All the hills are covered, beautiful, beautiful places. I could stay there forever <laughs> because the house they are very cheap. Actually, it's a mud house, you know, and many holes on the walls, a hole on the roof. You have to find a corner where the rain cannot come in. Uh, but the scorpion and the snake can still come in and sit with you. Maybe they wanted also to become Buddha. <laughs> same direction with me, so they did not bite me at all. Sometimes I wake up uh, from sleep or somebody, I have to remove them carefully. Don't try that. If you go to Himalaya, you want to remove them, you bring a bag with you for the snack, okay? Snack, they like to crawl in the bag. They won't harm you if you give them a bag. But with a stick, long stick, okay, and open the bag with the other end of the stick and slowly let him go in. Use your mind to tell him, please, come in there, it's warmer, it's nicer, it's better there, it's safer. Yeah, if you have this mind power, otherwise just wait patiently, don't move too fast. And the scorpion is easier, you know. 
You can use a small cup or something and put him inside and slide a piece of paper or cardboard underneath and put him in a big rock, very like that. Same with centipede, yeah, same. Same with all these kind of uh, insects. They will, they will not harm you, well, I, I hope. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> they did not harm me, but I'm not sure, okay, about others. They did harm the person next to me. As I told you before, I slept on top of the mud house the roof, and there are several of them also. There's one lady, a young girl next to me. Oh, they beat her in black and blue. We, we rushed him to emergency quick. I don't know, I left for Rishikesh after that, so I didn't know what happened to her. I think she'll be okay. I think in India they should have some uh, preparation for this kind of incident because there's a lot of them everywhere. <laughs> so they probably are prepared somewhere in the ashram or small hospital, you know. In Rishikesh, it's, it's not that uh, easy to find a hospital or something, so probably they have some homemade remedy or something like that, huh? We were talking about Dram Salah. Yeah, he told me that she affected him from London because of the things he's doing. It's not uh, proper. And he's a monk, and she was not. Uh, well, oh well, whatever. And then she teached that type. But she could not control herself. She could not, she has not reached a perfect control to teach and to control herself. That's why I told you it's a very dangerous method. Or maybe she has reached uh, perfection to control herself, fine. But then because she took in disciples and uh, too much karma that weakened her resistance or mastery of her own practice, that could happen also. But her husband, the monk, the Tibetan monk, I was not uh, teaching any disciple and still studying with uh, another teacher yeah, at that time. He took me to see his teacher also. And he shook his head and said, you, you should not <laughs> look down upon this woman. <laughs> at that time, uh, I was wearing long hair. I wore Hindu monk's robe, but I wasn't officially... Uh, initiated into Hindu monk later, much later. Or is it before or after? That was before I became Hindu monk under the uh, Giri tradition, yeah? The old, very old, very old tradition. But I did not really wear monk robe, it's just a robe, you know, <laughs> in the monk's color. Because I'm worried if I wear uh, those... Uh, uh, normal dress, you know, I will invite trouble for myself. I did sometimes before or after, I forgot. So I went to a library to look for, for sutras, you know, to borrow, to read at home. And uh, the Tibetan community under the Dalai Lama gracious direction, they also even opened a library in English. I did not ask for other languages, but I'm sure they have some also for Tibetan or Chinese. But in English we have. And you just sign your name and then you borrow a book. The next time you come, you return it and borrow another book. Yeah, and I was searching around looking and this monk came behind me. I was in the tantric section. At that time I didn't know what tantric was. I just saw that the sutra, you know, practice, so I look. I read all the books already, so I was just in that section, but I did not even pick out any book yet. I was just looking, and the monk came behind me and asked me if I want to practice tantric yoga. And I asked him, what is it? <laughs> so he kind of generally explained, you know, it's a different. It's not in a very uh, clear term of what it is, you know? So... He said, if I want to practice tantric yoga, he can uh, introduce to me yeah, a, a teacher. Oh, I said, I, I'm not sure yet. I'm just <laughs> looking around. I'm not sure what I wanted really. Uh, first, I have to study what it is in order to know whether or not uh, I like to practice it. I'm Buddhist, I told him. I'm Buddhist and Catholic. I told him that both. And then we talk, and then I don't know, uh, he followed me 
or not. I don't know. We met again somehow. And then uh, one day he asked me where I live. I, I say, uh, over there in, in that forest, in the mud house, together with some other practitioners. Not together with them. I have my own. Each one rent a little room, you know, together. It's actually quite cheap. Um, the Tibetan community, they made them for practitioners who come to see the Dalai Lama, for example. Yeah, so it's not like they make money or anything. Maybe that's why they could not repair the walls with holes and the roof with the leaking. Yes, and I had to cook for myself and all that. Yeah, so not that 84,000 method we can practice all of them. If you really don't want to follow any master, then just follow the Buddha, the precept. Yeah, study the sutra, stay alone. Follow the precept. At least if you don't go out and interact with anybody, then the five precepts or ten precepts are good enough for you. And being vegan, okay? Uh, live like a monk or a nun, without harming anyone, without doing anything that might uh, make yourself vulnerable to the attack of the energy of, of bad people. Always remember the Buddha's name any name you choose. There are many Buddhas. You choose one that appeals to you. When I first begin to practice at home, yeah, I just read the sutra and recite uh, one Buddha after another. <laughs> Today, uh, Kristigaba, tomorrow Amitabha, next day, Kwaning Bodhisattva. But most of my life before, as a lay person, I, I like Kwaning Bodhisattva because of her very great compassion, yeah, and always available, according to the, the sutra, yeah? So I always call on her, yeah, whenever I remember or whenever I'm in trouble. She, she did help. <laughs> I have to thank her a lot, always thank her a lot. At that time, when I was young, I went to the temple and also went to the church, you know? I went to the temple, became a temple scout, you know, like youth scout, we do something like scouts do, yeah. But that's all. It's not much. Uh, the monks there did not teach me much. We just been a scout. That's it. <laughs> and every Sunday we gather together, go into the forest or go into something, do some adventure stuff, and learning how to uh, react in the jungle, in the wild, or something like that, and try not to step on insects and stuff like that. Why did I tell you this? I don't know. <laughs> Why was that? Hmm? Because the Guanyin method is most, most convenient. Ah, yeah, most convenient, all right, convenient method. Yeah. Because you only listen to your own self-nature, okay? You need no action outside. You need not do anything. It's your own nature. So it was good that I just had this example, you know, right in my pocket and <laughs> pull it out to you. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to tell you. It's from my own experience, eh, in the Dharamsala. Oh, my God. Because his master tell him that I am something very good. Yeah. So maybe that's why I think he wanted something from me, which I did not know I have at that time. <laughs> if he asked for my blessing, and if I knew I had it, I would have blessed him. I didn't know anything. I was just fumbling in my own darkness to find the light. I think he know. His master told him something that I don't understand in Tibetan. So he, he thinks I'm something good. So he wants the more contact, the deeper contact, so that he can get the blessing or something like that. So after that, uh, if I see him, I just avoid. I went somewhere else and talked to somebody. So then I don't see him anymore, a lot afterward. Now, every method that maybe you encounter from your teacher or master somewhere, it could lead you to liberation in normal circumstances, provided your teacher is a master of that method. Then he can transmit it to you, the same quality, the same enlightening quality that he has, yeah? 
But if this master is not yet stable, maybe he just reached <laughs> the mastership, but he did not have the power to sustain it. Or if he has too many disciples, then he cannot be that stable. That's why in the old time, uh, many teachers never take a lot of disciples. Uh, many followers, maybe, but not a lot of disciples. Like the Zen tradition, Master Bodhidharma, he sat for a long time facing the wall alone. But he took only five disciples. Remember? Five. And only one of them became his successor. Remember that? Do you know or not know? Yes. Oh, well, I don't know if I read you that story of Bodhidharma. No? Yes or no? Yes. Before, yeah? Ah, okay, the full story or just simple? Never mind, next time, maybe. <laughs> uh, even five of his disciples, only one of them really get to the bottom of what the truth is from Bodhidharma. And he really was a master. Bodhidharma was a master. Five disciples only. A lot of people follow him, of course, because the many miracles happen around him and because of him and from him. <laughs> yeah, but only five disciples he has. And only one of them truly get the essence of the Dharma. The other four are just answer nonsense. Even you answer better than that. I'm so sorry. Sorry, Bodhidharma. <laughs> he knew it. Anyway, there's a truth, right? If you read his story, you know that. One of them answered something, he said, Oh, you only outside the skin. <laughs> and the other one say, Only hair or whatever. And only one is really inside his bones, meaning he correctly understood the teaching that he imparted to him. That's why the Bodhidharma, after that, he left, went back to India. They think they bury him <laughs> in the coffin, but it's not. He left. <laughs> he left with his body as well. There are some methods you can study and learn, and you can keep your body also. And you can come in and out of heaven as well, at will. Even the normal astral king can teach you that, how to keep your body and take it away anywhere you want without people seeing. And normally, some people can also disappear, you know, like uh, disintegrate into the air and you don't find them or hide themselves behind the sun, sun rays behind the wind, behind the air. Yes, can do all that. Just take a long time to practice. I had all that. I had to forsake it so that I can do what I'm doing. Actually, in the original spiritual term, we don't call that magical power. The magical power from, are from the lower level from the third level, second level, to the astral level. That's what we call magical power. But higher than that, we call them wonders. You know? Wonders. And the master of higher level, they have six wonders. Like they can disappear, they can go through a wall, they can unlock the door, they can fly in the air, they can make fire, flame, for example, like that. But these look similar to the astral level magic, but they are not. Because if the master had to use it, he, she doesn't owe anything to the astral world. But the normal magicians, eh, like some of the magicians you know, right? They practice them. They owe this power to the astral world or the uh, second world mostly astral world. So they cannot be liberated. If they use their power, they stay within the control of the astral hierarchy. So that's why the Buddha, the Buddha Shakyamuni, precisely, forbid his disciple to use any magical power because he knows they learned it before they met him and they can only learn it 
through the astral uh, master. Some astral beings can come to this world for a period of time. I told you already, I think in Hungarian retreat. Yes? Okay. And then they can teach you also, if you're good to them. Truly like that, some, uh, some fairy angels, uh, gods from a lower order, they come. And if the, you help them in some way, whether or not they tested you or you just help them because you are kind in their need while, while they are in the physical body, then they can repay you, you know, very amply, you know. So you hear many stories before, like uh, a person, a poor person helps somebody in need, and suddenly that person says, okay, I give you three wishes, three boons. <laughs> Tell me what you need, and I give it to you, etc., etc. These are not just fairy tales or housewives' uh, tales. They are true. They are true story. Okay? Maybe adding a little bit of salt and pepper here and there, but they are true story. Okay? You could even meet some astral being or second level being or third being on the street. You would never know. You would not know. Because they look just like us. Yes. They can manifest themselves like a human or animals or for anything they want, trees. Yeah. When Guru Nanak was young, he slept under a tree. And one of the observers noticed that the tree, shade, keep following him <laughs> because the sun, <laughs> the sun is shining on him and the sun keep moving. So the tree shade keep moving to protect him. <laughs> yeah. For example, like that. So the best is that you don't care who is who. Respect everyone. I myself personally respect all of you, all the people outside, all the, the worst disciples that I ever had also. If I have to take care of them in some not gentle way, please, Understand, they need that, okay? Just like you have children at home, sometimes they're too rough, too mischievous. You have to use some ungentle way to, to trim them. Because you never know, as the disciples, you think you're perfect, or at least you think you're okay. You're not. Many of you are not, okay? 64% of you are good, I said to you. Good meaning not harmful to me. But the other percent are quite <laughs> a handful because they think they're okay, but they do not realize they are not okay. Yes, they do not realize it. They did not mean to, to be even proud or arrogant. They truly think they are okay, but there are things they do Thing that they thought, concept that they have, action that they perform are not okay. But according to them, they think it's okay. Thus, making more and more trouble for themselves and for me to have to take care. Okay? So these so-called initiates or disciples should reflect inside, find more time to meditate, to really check inside yourself. Not check me or check your neighbors or your fellow uh, initiates, but check inside yourself. Have this opportunity not to be too busy going to, <laughs> to retreat or going to group meditation, going to do charity work or anything. Just take care of yourselves. Be good to yourselves so that you can climb up together with other people. Hmm? As I told you before, I wasn't ashamed to have told you that some of my so-called disciples are still at the hell level. Did I tell you that? Yes. Yeah. At my own expense, I told you that. Okay? And I try a lot still, but they still, some of them have not came out of their own slumber. Okay, huh? So please, this is difficult for you to know who is who. Yeah? Heavens know, and they always tell me, okay? Even if I don't see it, they tell me. They point out this, that, that, and even tell me the names. So you do not think that you are alone. 
<laughs> in bad or good situation, <laughs> we are transparent to the whole universe. Okay? There's nothing we can hide, really. Not to talk about people who has magic or who has this uh, clairvoyant eye that they can see your aura to know what kind of people you are. Okay? Your magnetic field says everything. Your aura says everything. Not to talk about that. Talk about invisible beings, the heavens and hells even. They see you all. There's nothing we can hide except ourselves. It's good we have this body so we don't see too much. Otherwise we'll be too scared or too sad. Sometimes people say ignorance is blitz <laughs> because of that. Don't ever think that you are something, okay? And don't ever always think that maybe the person who, who you trust or you love are really perfect. Not necessary, okay, huh? Yes. Because sometimes the person you are so-called maybe in love with, okay, that cannot be helped because you may be enemies, <laughs> past life, then love at first sight. <laughs> then don't blame me if the lover cannot come to new land. It's for your good also, as well as good for everyone else here. Because you cannot see it. You cannot see it outside. She, he look the same like you and could even talk sweetly and uh, uh, maybe volunteer to do many hard jobs. Nothing like that counts in the eyes of heavens. In the eyes of heavens, saints, only the inside counts. Okay? Just like we practice the Kuan Yin method. We practice only inside. Nobody see that you're practicing anything. You don't even have big prayer beat. Yes. You don't have uh, even any clothes to signify that you're something different. That they have been monks and none, I don't mean that, okay? They have been before they met me or after they meet me. That doesn't matter. That's their choice, okay? But doesn't mean that signify that they practice Kuan Yin method even. They just stay in any temple or go out, people think they're just a monk and nuns, yeah? And you, you practice inside. You see the light inside, the here, the inside nature. Nobody see nothing. Nobody know who you are. Because inside, that counts. The Buddha say you turn yourself inward to hear your own nature. He didn't say use your ears to hear music outside to hear anything. Even one of his disciples listening to the Buddha's voice in the beginning and get some enlightenment. Even Buddha did not say that is the best method because he knows if the Buddha is sick or the Buddha gone nirvana and the human beings cannot hear his voice anymore, then how will they get enlightenment? So, of the 84,000 method. Still, the inner sound, inner light are the best, the most reliable, because they're always there. It's you, it's your nature. It will never die, it never disappear, it never stop. Even your body die, it will still be there. With your astral body, with your second body, with your third body, with four, five, etc. body. So that's the only thing that lasts with you forever, wherever you go whatever level you attain, because it is you, it is your true self. That's why the Buddha <laughs> emphasized that in many sutras, not just one. Okay? All the master taught this method, not just one master. If you really have time, you study all the scripture, here and there, always mention <laughs> Either a different name, Shabd, Shabda, that's the inner sound. For example, that is in uh, Hindu, <laughs> Sanskrit, Shabda means the sound. And they talk everything, it's all about the light and the sound and the true self. It's just that if you don't practice Kuan Yin method, you would not capish what they're talking about. Or capish very little, no matter what religion you follow, 
you don't understand the scriptures. And now, do you understand your scriptures? Yes or no? Yes. How many understand? Raise hand. I mean, different religion. How many of you understand your scripture when you read it? Only four or five people? Are you joking? The scripture, the teaching of the Buddha. I don't mean the Surangama Sutra, maybe it's difficult, but when the Buddha talk about the hearing inside, hearing the sound inside, seeing the light inside, did you understand? Do you understand? Yes or no? The Buddhist. Okay. The Catholic, do you understand the sound of the thunder? The word, yeah? in the beginning of the world, meaning the original word, the original sound, lack of vocabulary, they say the word. Because if they say the sound, the people might think the sound outside, no? I ask again, do you understand? You're teaching now. Raise your hand so I can see it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Mm. Because if you don't, please walk out of here. <laughs> because up to now, if the people who practice many years still don't understand the Buddha scripture, I mean some simple one when he talk about only the light and sound and self-nature, then please just walk out of my uh, greenhouse, <laughs> my uh, palace, yeah. Oh, God. Or oh, the Christian even, if you don't understand Jesus talking, even if they censor a lot, they cut a lot already, still here and there you find it. God talk, God's voice like sound of thunder, and God appear like flame, like a burst, Flame in the bush, but the bush don't burn. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Thing like that. Oh, my God. Okay. I know. I'm not all well, but when I'm talking to you, I'm very energetic like that. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> nothing else in my mind. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. Except this. Except you and the present moment. Lucky I'm not running for president of any country, hey? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be them all. <laughs> Even the people who are not uh, able to stay or come to New Land, this probably temporarily only, okay, is the dark time of your life. Maybe you did something wrong, or maybe you thought something wrong, maybe something, or you have not tried hard enough to practice. You just practice outside and not inside. So check yourself out, okay? Not check anybody else. Not even how your president is doing, okay? <laughs> See, he doing their best, huh? as they know it, okay? In their own circumstance, they have their own problem, they have their pressure, they have other party pressure, they have people pressure, they do what they can. Uh, don't criticize anybody, criticize yourself. That's what I advise. Now, I uh, <laughs> promise to read you the story, I'll try, okay? The story begins now. Next story concerns uh, giving refuge to the demon king. Imagine that. Huh? The demon king came and <laughs> took refuge in Lord Mahavira, because they know who's who. This is only the sixth year, half the time of his, uh, you know, complete practicing. Of course, the Lord Mahavira did not know or did not think or did not promise that he will practice ascetism for twelve years, but in the book it is says so. So only halfway through, the demon king already came and took refuge in him. The demons, they know. Even if they are demons, they know who is who. That is the problem. We are transparent. We cannot cheat anybody for long. And even if we can, we will have to pay heavy price for that, soon or later, this life or the next. The law of the universe will not spare anybody, no matter who you are. It's only the inside that counts, because they know the inside. Even at that time, the Lord Mahavira did not even realize his own self-greatness yet. He's only halfway through. He knows maybe he has some little power of compassion, cool the fire or resist the demons' tricks and 
the snake bites and stuff like that, but he did not know that he is the Buddha yet. Still, the demons already knew and came, took refuge in him. I told you already in India, I was just walking around <laughs> looking for a book to read. The Bhagavad Gita is very famous, you know, I want to know what is it all about. I just want to read that book. And uh, it's, people already come follow me, want to be my disciple. <laughs> the reluctant master on the Ganges River <laughs> had to teach because promised already. <laughs> but he had very good experience. He has absolute faith. So I came back some years later. He said, oh, my great big guru coming. Big guru. I'm only so small. <laughs> One meter less than 50 something. <laughs> my big guru coming. My great guru coming. Everybody was so, huh, looking. <laughs> Who is your big guru? Oh, a small girl. <laughs> At that time I was only maybe 30 and wearing the robe that they have never seen in their life. The Chinese <laughs> monk's robe. I was already a monk. I went back to India. I had nothing to do at that time. I had only a couple of disciples. <laughs> hey, if you are destined to be in the public eyes and teach people, you cannot run away. I didn't know anything <laughs> at that time. My level was not all that high. I didn't know I was going to be a master or anything. But even one of my teacher, one of my master at that time, he knows. He has a vision, and he told his secretary, uh, his uh, assistant, he told me, after he died, uh, there will be a woman who come and take over. And she told me that. But of course, he didn't tell me it's me now. <laughs> I said, oh, that's nice. Mm. <laughs> I wish I know who she is. <laughs> and she don't tell me nothing. <laughs> and then, I don't know, somehow word gets out. So many of the Sikh, uh, many of the disciples, residents in that ashram at that time, uh, they come praising me or bow to me, I scare me to death. <laughs> the old man with beautiful white dignified turban and long beard, white like this, white hair and white long beard, come and prostrate to me. My God, I was so scared. <laughs> I run away, I drop my newspaper, <laughs> I'd run away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe word got out. Yeah. This secretary of that master, she could not keep secret. That I knew, yeah. <laughs> but she keeps secret to me. She just say that, but she don't say nothing more. But she always check on me, you know. At night, she always came in my room. I see a man still writing or doing something. Say, what are you doing? I, I was a little bit kind of awe of her, you know. She's a master closest, you know. And it's been a long time, and she's big and German, you know. Wow. Long blonde hair and big and very... Muscular, and I'm a very small, black hair, <laughs> new, <laughs> just write some letters for the master, <laughs> have no position in the ashram, and always uh, came late for lunch and dinner, and I'm always hungry, <laughs> and always want to have some chocolate and never can. All money offered to master. I thank God for that, but, you know, I had no money <laughs> to buy even a piece of Indian Sweet. When you don't have enough food, you will crave for sweet. Make sure you eat enough, okay? Don't be too ascetic because you need this temple, okay? You need it. You need it. Just don't eat for greed and glutinous reason, but eat enough so that your body function, okay? So they can use all the energy to concentrate on the inside because if you don't eat enough, your body craves for something. Your mind is busy thinking of food, and you can hardly concentrate. The Buddhas and his Shanghas are different. They live in different time. Okay? At that time, there's no pollution, not much temptation, not much of the so-called civilization that can bother them too much. Okay? They don't know what Mercedes is, <laughs> so they cannot even want it. 
<laughs> the best is just to sit in a horse car. Everybody has that. <laughs> or a horse, even the best horse is just a horse. <laughs> okay, look like every other horse outside. It's not much to tempt you. Being a monk at that time, they must go out for alms. That is a normal procedure of that time, okay? Otherwise, the Buddha could also ask his father, the king, to supply him and his monks all the things that they need and more. But he wanted to follow that tradition, old tradition of monks and nuns. The monks and nuns in India, the Hindu, they still do that. They still wander around so that they don't feel attached to any place. And they uh, receive alms whenever they have. If they don't have, they just go hungry. I don't know what method they practice. But if you want to practice uh, ascetism, then just follow that, okay? If you want to practice Kuan Yin method, it's a different method, okay? Uh, ascetism, you have to forego many things. You have to wear only one pair of clothes or two maximum. One to wash, one to wear. And you eat only one time a day. Whatever is given to you, you eat. That is a different uh, method of practice, okay? You practice the method of ascetism. You will also arrive at liberation from the three worlds. That is a lot already. I mean, you go to the fourth world maximum. Okay? And maybe there, Buddha, Bodhisattva, Saint will help you to climb up more slowly. But you are liberated from the three worlds. And that is for sure. If you follow the monks and nuns' practice of ascetism. Okay? You must not want anything. You must not ask for anything except what's given to you. If not given to you, you just keep quiet. And you don't have a house. You don't have an abode of comfort. You must go somewhere alone, maybe a thatch hut if somebody built it for you, or in the jungle, alone, under the tree. Then you will reach liberation and you study the Buddha Sutra, remember Buddha all the time. Whatever method you choose from Buddha as a method, you have to follow that. You cannot do anything more, truly. Mm-hmm.